Poor countries and even poor people are often blamed for their plight. You better do something better. It's your culture. It's, it's your bad government. It's your corruption. Well, sometimes those factors play a role. But often uh, poor countries remain poor in part because they live in very difficult places on the planet. Physical geography is one of the seven main categories for a good differential diagnosis of economic development, though it's one that strangely is often overlooked by economic practitioners. I'm not exactly sure why that is, because when in fact you're standing at 14,000 feet above sea level on the Bolivian Altiplano and wondering why this country is having some problems, it pretty much strikes you in the face looking at those uh, gorgeous mountains uh, surrounding you and, and uh, the snow-capped peaks that while its natural beauty is absolutely superlative, the cost of doing business there could be pretty high. And indeed, when you look carefully at how geography affects the diffusion of economic growth, you find that it's very powerful and that it gives very strong indications of how today's poor countries should focus their attention, their resources, and their problem solving, because a lot of it involves overcoming these physical difficulties. Look again at the map that we've seen now several times of the gross domestic product per person on the planet. Remember how income per capita at the very low levels in tropical Africa, for example, in South Asia, uh, in uh, a few other parts of the world, is concentrated geographically. That's not an accident. Those places have difficulties in terms of physical geography that have impeded the development of those regions, have meant that as the uh, concentric waves, uh, ripples uh, coming out from the epicenter of global growth have spread throughout the world, they often haven't reached these remaining poor places. This is a map of the world's large urban areas. And we can see the cities uh, of populations above 1 million and, and the mega cities above 5 million shown in this map. And while you find large cities in most parts of the world, take a close look and notice the high proportion of cities along the coasts of the continents. And for those that are in the interior of the continents, very often they are along major rivers so that they have at least uh, waterborne trade, the kind that Adam Smith talked about more than 200 years ago as being the low-cost kind of trade. And that is one of the major reasons why large cities have developed and grown where they have. Being on the coast, being near ports, being near major rivers has been the key to a vibrant economy with a division of labor that promotes productivity and that allows for economic growth because of access not only for exports to world markets at competitive costs, but also for the ability to buy inputs from the rest of the world and bring them for processing or for local use. Now, if we identify the major ports of the world and then ask about the proximity of the world's populations to those ports, we learn some very interesting things. Have a look at this map where each dot, each black dot, is a major port. And one can then look at the distribution of world's population within each country and ask how far is that population from the nearest port. If it's a landlocked country, there's an added problem. There is a nearest port, but the nearest port, by definition, is in someone else's country. So not only do you have to go over land to reach that seaport, you have to cross a political border as well. And that can be a major hindrance. In the map that you're looking at, countries are shaded according to the average distance of their populations 
from the closest port to each part of that country and then averaged over the country. You can see that the places in Western Europe, in the United Kingdom, in the Arabian Peninsula, along the eastern coast, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, these are places almost by definition right at the port. And these are countries that are advantaged by very low-cost transport conditions. England, uh, with uh, its uh, many rivers, uh, with its uh, coastal access, and London as a city uh, on the Thames, uh, able to engage in great international trade, was made possible because it has the advantage of a great river and great access to world trade. But the large continental countries take uh, Russia, shown in red here, meaning that its populations are very far from the closest port, have a big disadvantage. Uh, and Russia did not develop a lot of trading cities. There's St. Petersburg uh, up uh, uh, in the Baltics, uh, but for most of Russia, the cities are land-based and face huge overland transport conditions. Have a look at Africa. Almost the entire center of tropical Africa is in red. Not surprising. Most of the countries shown there are landlocked countries. Africa has the largest number of landlocked countries in the world. And it means for those countries, the populations are far from the ports and politically far from the ports as well because of the problem of crossing a political boundary even to get to the nearest port. Turns out that countries' abilities to engage in international trade and thereby to be part of the wave of global growth is strongly related to the evidence shown in this picture. The countries that have proximate access to international trade have tended to grow better faster and earlier, and those that are landlocked and far from the ports have tended, with some important exceptions, to be laggards in the process of economic development. Now, the next map shows yet another crucial aspect of physical geography. We know that energy is at the core of the ability to engage in every economic activity, whether it's farming, industry, uh, services, transport, uh, home conveniences, energy is vital. And we know indeed that the steam engine really represented the whole takeoff of the Industrial Revolution because for the first time in human history, humanity could use coal and thereafter fossil fuels more generally, coal, oil, and natural gas, as a major source of energy for the world economy. That gave a profound impetus to modern economic growth. But the distribution of these fossil fuels that have been so important for the world economy over two centuries is highly varied. Some parts of the world are blessed with massive deposits. Other places in the world have almost none. In the 19th century, coal was king. We did not yet have uh, in the economy, uh, even the internal combustion engine and the automobile using oil. And so coal was absolutely central for industry through the steam engine, for transport through rail and steamships and so forth. But look at the map. Who has coal? Who doesn't have coal? Well, England, of course, has it. Western Europe has lots of coal. The United States, Russia, Africa. Very little coal, almost none in tropical Africa. That's no accident of uh, politics or culture. That's a matter of deep geology. When the coal was formed through tens of millions of years, the African continent was in the wrong place with the wrong climate and the wrong conditions to generate uh, coal over the Earth's history. And the result is that when the steam engine was developed in uh, the late 18th century, Africa had uh, no local coal that it could use. And even when countries tried in Africa, such as Egypt in North Africa, 
in the middle of the 19th century to develop industry based on imported coal, the costs were just too high of transport to be able to make a go of it. So the deposits of resources, a pure accident of geography uh, and geology can make a huge difference. The next uh, picture I'd like you to look at is another map of the world. Uh-huh, this doesn't look like a map of the world at all. Uh, this is not the shape of the planet as we know it. It is the shape of the planet if each country is given the size of its oil reserves. And uh, what you see here, of course, right at the center of the map is Saudi Arabia with its massive reserves of petroleum. And you see other large uh, countries on this world map, which doesn't look like a world map, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, Venezuela, this major world reserves. The United States shows up there. It's used up a lot of its uh, historical legacy of reserves. Where's Africa? It barely shows up on the map because only a few places in Africa, uh, Nigeria and Angola, and now a few finds in other parts of Africa have given Africa uh, the home-based potential of petroleum. And when one measures these reserves relative to the national populations, of course, the differences are even more vast. Some countries have massive reserves per capita, a country like Kuwait. That leads to huge income per capita. Other countries like Mali or Niger or Chad have populations with no oil to speak of or just tiny uh, amounts. And they have suffered from the absence of traditional fossil fuel energies of any kind. They have something up their sleeve now with modern technology, lots of sunshine. So solar power could be uh, a great breakthrough in the age of sustainable development for many countries that were unlucky in the sense of not having the fossil fuels to give them the local energy resources for their development. There's another aspect to geography that makes a huge difference, and that is climate. Not surprising, because we all need food and water to survive, to thrive, and uh, climate has a huge effect, not only on the quality of our lives, but on the ability to grow food for our sustenance. You're looking at a climate map of the world. I find this map quite beautiful. The colors, the variation around the world, it's quite complicated because climate scientists have created many climate classification systems. The Kirpin-Geiger system that's shown in this map is one that I prefer. The pink and the red areas are the warm tropical areas. They have very distinctive challenges in food production and in disease burden where many diseases such as malaria thrive. The beige areas of the world are the drylands where water is scarce or in the desert areas basically non-existent. And dry regions have the very particular problem of growing food and they have particular vulnerabilities to extreme poverty by the difficulties of food production. The light green and the dark green areas are the temperate zones in this climate system. They tend to have winters and summers and most of them have pretty plentiful water throughout the year though the particular kind of temperate climate varies. Most of the high income economies of the world traditionally have been in these temperate zones. Food production, dairy production, uh, timber, uh, other uh, parts of agriculture have been favored in the temperate zones and since modern economic growth began in a temperate zone economy in England it naturally spread to other temperate zone uh, locations like most of the United States, like Australia, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, uh, and so on. So climate has made a big difference. And in the next map, you'll see one of the reasons why climate uh, is so powerful, not only for food production, but for the location of disease burden. Malaria is a disease that 
in the rich world we may read about but don't experience firsthand except on visits to tropical locations. And that is because of the physical environment. It's a disease that is only transmitted when temperatures are above about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. In cooler climates, you don't get malaria transmission. And in the very warm places that are warm all year round, such as tropical Africa, you can have very high year-round malaria transmission. Well, we know, as we're reminded uh, of uh, a child being attended uh, for malaria, that repeated bouts of malaria not only claim vast numbers of lives, still hundreds of thousands every year, but they debilitate societies unless the disease is controlled. Children don't finish schooling. If they survive, they may have long-term uh, difficulties and, and uh, uh, liabilities uh, as a result. And so in this way, we see that climate has uh, very subtle and often very insidious ways of holding back economic development. There's good news, of course. A disease like malaria and many other tropical diseases can be brought under control. But it's an extra challenge, an extra expense. It's one of those things that needs to be targeted if we are to succeed in sustainable development. Geography is not uh, deterministic. It's not true that a difficult geography prevents development, but geography conditions economic development. And unless we understand it, focus on it, and target the problems that can result, countries can get stuck. If we pay attention to the lessons of geography, however, we can help spring countries now stuck in poverty from the poverty trap and enable them to, to get onto the path of economic development.